This packaging room used to be my machine room. This processing warehouse used to be my classroom. And this area on the other side of the wall used to be my workspace. My businesses have expanded to the point where I basically have no more room to work and my home garage is pretty full because it's, well, really small. But over the years, I have shot a bunch of footage for potential videos that were never finished or released. And at the end of each video, I'll tell you why it was never released in case you wanted to know. I'm Justin and this is the Lost Episode series from TFS. When I was a kid, my favorite place in all of Vegas was called Scandia, and my favorite attraction at that family fun center was the bumper boats. Of course, that's what I tell people when they can't believe that I just wanted to build some bumper boats. The truth is, I would wanted to build something fun that my friends and I can go smash around on, you know, like a day at the lake, good people, relaxation, ramming into shit. I mean, it sounds like a lot of fun, right? And bumper boats are actually pretty simple. I mean, you only need something that floats, you need something that powers the floaty thing, and you need something to sit on. The rest of it's just going to have to be designed and fabricated. But having never built a boat before, let alone one that you're supposed to go intentionally ramming into stuff with, it took me a few tries to get it right. Version 1 was a small tube strapped to a frame which had provisions for an inboard mounted outboard engine from Amazon, and a head mount for a seat. After a quick test in my accountant's big ass pool, it was pretty evident that this uh, size of boat here was better suited for younger me. Oh. <laughs> that to happen. Uh. We're gonna need a bigger boat. After searching for a bigger tube, I was able to source one on Amazon, and this one is about 6 feet in diameter, so when you compare it to the size of the version 1 tube, it definitely offers up a bit more space. So I quickly designed and built a new hull and frame for the seat and transom, but this time I moved the seat a little bit more central and lower just in case a 6 foot tube still wasn't stable enough. I also slapped on a set of gold pro taper bars because they look sick. And now it's back to the pool for some more testing. Oh, come on. Stability problem. Solved. I can stand in this thing, sit in it, spin around, I can stand on the side of it instead of having to be completely central. I mean, one person can sit on the side of the tube while the other one operates it. I mean, this thing ain't tipping anywhere. But I did find a couple of other issues here. The first is that it doesn't keep water out of it very well. There's usually about three or four inches of standing water depending on how many people are in the watercraft, which basically means all that water is going to drag and this thing is going to go really, really slow. Another potential flaw that I'm not too keen on is that no matter how tight you get the straps on the hull, the tube will shift quite a bit when you're bumping into stuff. So I kind of want to see if we can figure that one out. And finally, the seat really doesn't need to be this low or that far forward. I can make it a little bit more room in here if I just move it back. So it's back to the drawing board for the third time. This time around, I designed the hull with an inner ring structure, and this both keeps the water out of the boat and it also keeps the tube from shifting around. Adds a bit more rigidity. I also designed it with a clear acrylic floor, which is an idea my wife and my accountant came up with. This does double the weight of the boat, but it's just way too cool not to have. I also moved the seat up and back to create just a little bit of extra space for required boat stuff like, you know, fire extinguisher, air horn, registration, all that good stuff. But with this new hull design, I had a slight snag. These pieces are now way too big for my plasma table, so I ran down the street to Ashba Studios and borrowed his table, because it's much, much bigger. If you're wondering about this sketchy little dance in the leaf blower, it's because this is aluminum which loves to warp when pieces are this big. Now the leaf blower did help to cool them down a little while I was cutting, and of course we did pause the machine in between cuts which helped out as well, but absolutely nothing beats a couple hundred of extra pounds of weight added to the top of it. And for all of my safety commenter viewers who get kickbacks from OSHA, I did have the remote in my hand just in case something went wrong and the machine needed to be stopped. And pause. <laughs> I'm actually really surprised at how well this first cut went. 
that leaf blower was a, a really good idea. So this is some super thin stuff. Uh, well, it looks to be dimensionally correct. <laughs> now, while we were doing the plasma dance, the file for the acrylic floor was getting tool pathed and made ready for the router. Now, watching this thing go around in circles for an hour is really freaking boring. So here it is all cut out. I mean, it's, it's gonna need some cleanup work, but you know, that only takes a few minutes. So with big pieces and little pieces in hand, I have one more stop I need to make before I can put all of this stuff together. Now this guy here is Scott. He owns Fabrication Syndicate here in Vegas where he specializes in one-off part fabrication for a lot of different industries. He's also one of the awesome welding instructors over at WeldCoach.com in case you just happen to be looking for a one-on-one -on -one welding lesson from a guy that knows, builds, and welds a lot of stuff. But in order to make the inner ring fit nicely to the lower hull, it has to first be made into a ring. And Scott has a sheet metal roller at his disposal, which saved me from having to go buy one that I will probably never use again. After a couple of cranks of the handle, we're off and running. So back at my shop now, I decided to start with the hulls and get them knocked out because they'll take the longest to do. The thickness of the lower plate on the hull is an eighth of an inch, and the inner ring is half of that. Now the two are lined up with tabs and slots, which makes assembly a lot easier, and this project kind of has to have some accuracy because parts were machined and cut, and this helps to keep that and maintain that accuracy. Now, not a lot of welding really needs to be done on the hull. I mean, just a few welds are needed to keep everything tightly in place so that I can flip it over and then weld the tabs into the slots. I did plan for and design the inner ring to have a small gap at the back of it, but it looks like I fat fingered the dimension somewhere in the drawing. So a small backer strip had to be added so I could fill in the gap. And once the holes were all welded, I did a good cleanup and prep on them before priming it up. Now the primer is going to need a bunch of time to dry and cure properly, so I set them aside and moved on to the framework. Cutting and prepping tubes is not very fun to watch, so it's done. Same goes with prepping all of the cut parts, but I did those too. But one cool thing I couldn't resist was putting the tabs and slots together on some of these assemblies and seeing how well they fit. It's oddly satisfying. It's going to be so nice to weld. Before I get to welding all of these parts together, I do have to seal up the holes. Now, the sealer I'm using is a two-part epoxy pond sealer, which will keep the metal protected and provide a good surface for our acrylic floor to bond to. Now this stuff does take some time to cure, so if I get it all done now and then set it aside, I won't have to wait for them by the time I am done welding and assembling all the frames and the engines and stuff like that. Speaking of the engines, this is what I used. These are cheap little 50cc four-stroke outboard engines from China, or Amazon as they like to call it now. I'm pretty sure they're still less than 200 bucks each. I mean, they, they do the job, I mean, realistically. I'll, I'll put a link down below if you want to check them out. But the only major modification I did to them was to change out the spark plug to an NGK brand, and I added a lanyard-style kill switch, because, you know, if you go into the water, you kind of want the thing to shut off quickly and all by itself. I also decided that the top of the engines needed something better than a bright orange sticker with a brand name that I can't pronounce to look at. So I asked my wife to cut some decals with the intended model name of these boats. Don't ask why, but the TFS Ducky just popped into my head, so that's what I'm calling them. So now it's time to get welding. Now to keep everything as light and as strong as possible, aluminum is the choice of material for this boat. I also designed these parts to be welded together with maximum efficiency in mind. It may not seem like a big deal, but using mostly straight cuts instead of mitered cuts saves me a ton of time. The design of the lower frame has cutouts for the tubes to slide into, which reduces setup time and time spent measuring and verifying everything before welding. I can literally just slide the tube in and weld. I also mentioned the tab and slot design was going to be a pleasure to weld, and it definitely was, considering I didn't have to measure everything out and waste a bunch of time on it. All I did was just snap it together and start buzzing.
But one thing I did have to redo three different times was the handlebar mounts. As some of you might have noticed that the handlebar mounts on the version 2 were a little bit tweaked. This version is extra beefy with thicker material and has gussets for reinforcement. This ought to do the trick. Now with all the welding complete, I gave everything a final prep for coating. For the frames, I opted for a wrinkle black, which looks really cool. In the handlebar mounts, I used the anodized color from Duplicolor over a silver flake base. One was done in purple and the other one in red. I think they came out really nice. While those dry and cure, I moved on to the assembly. The acrylic floors were a little bit tedious to install because of their size, but after a generous and even application of adhesive sealer and a few tiny step laps around the mating surface, I could finally peel the protective coating off. I also sealed and installed the remaining hardware to the floor, and my friend and fellow YouTuber, Art by Adrock, cut this gasket out on his laser. It's so smooth, it's like these boats were professionally built or something. The only thing that did have me concerned this whole time was the tube itself. It is rubber, after all, and uh, I did buy it from Amazon for pretty cheap. And strapping it to a metal frame with sharp edges could mean that it will fall in the drink after the first bump. Or maybe even sooner. The solution to put me at ease was the weather stripping around the edges. I also got this on Amazon. Now this keeps the tube very tight and off the raw edges. Final assembly was a complete breeze. Now I realize that build dramas make for better entertainment, but everything just fit together as it was supposed to. It's kind of like these came from an assembly line in a factory or something. Securing the tube to the hull is a handful of super cheap tie-down straps from Amazon. Now, I would have liked to color match them to the boat, but orange was the cheapest. And to be honest, they're highly visible on the water, which is kind of a good thing. Now, since these tubes are brand new, I did secure them to the hull itself and let them kind of stretch a little bit, and then topped it off with some air until they were like really tight. It took a couple of days. But once I was confident that they would be fine, just gotta throw them in the water and throw them into the water is exactly what we did. Took them out to the lake, invited a bunch of friends, brought good food, drinks, whatever. It was, it was a complete friggin' blast. I mean, whether you wanted to, I don't know, go run into each other or bump into stuff, or you, know, you just wanted to cruise around the lake and look through the floor and see what's in the water. I mean, if you wanted to do that at Lake Mead, I mean, you could do it. And it was just, it was just a, a relaxing, really awesome time and a complete blast, like having a bunch of friends out and stuff like that, I mean, it is super cool. But why didn't I make this build video? Well, I'll shoot you straight. Uh, the answer is money. It's very, very simple. Uh, it may not make a lot of sense to you guys that aren't YouTubers or make a living on YouTube, but I'll do my best to explain. We, as content creators, get paid for views, right? And those views are basically determined by whatever content somebody wants to watch. So the majority of my content is educational type of content, which is not really where I wanted this channel to go, but that's where I, where I ended up. And the average education style video for its life cycle pays me between 30 and $50,000 on average. And that life cycle varies depending on the video and you know time passes, everything else like that. When I put out the teaser for the bumper boats that I was building them, uh, it, I think I looked at the, it, it's, it's paid like $99 since October of 22 when I posted till today or till now when you know, I'm looking it up in this video. These boats took me about three months or so to build. And uh, if I'm not gonna see any type of return on that and based on that, you know, that teaser video or whatever, uh, it's, you just got to cut your loss. I mean, this is a business at the end of the day, and if I'm going to lose the money and the time building the boats and not projected to make it back, then it's kind of a waste of time to produce the content and, you know, when I could be moving on to something else that actually does pay the bills, which that was, that was kind of a rude awakening, if you will. You know, it's just, it's, it's the way the algorithm works, and it kind of screwed me on that one. But now that I have a little bit of extra time to kind of dig through the old footage and whatnot, um, well, we'll see how this does. And if it pays nothing, then that's just the way that it works. I mean, it's, it's already written off, it's a loss. Uh, if you want to buy them, actually, hit me up. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it in the comments down there if, you know, when they're not for sale anymore. 
uh, if somebody buys them or whatever, because they are listed for sale locally. I just don't have the time to get out there and ride them out and have fun with them, whatever, right? And uh, yeah, if you want to build a set of bumper boats, I'm not releasing the plans for this. Uh, I'm not giving drawings or anything else like that. I mean, the reason why is because if you sell one, you literally, that's, that's all you're ever gonna make money on is the first one you sell, because after that, you know, anybody can have it after that. So I don't sell the plans or prints or anything else like that, but uh, I'll leave you a list of all the Amazon stuff. And of course you can go through the video and if you've got some skills, you could probably make your own, you know, you don't have to be this exquisite, but whatever. So either way, uh, you know, as always, I, I really appreciate you guys watching and sticking around and, uh, you know, going through even videos like this that may or may not be what you're totally interested in. So uh, it, you know, it means the world that you guys are still here and I really appreciate it. So I'll see you guys on the next episode.